The Lord be with you. It's a wonderful morning. I'm vertical. I'm back. I would have been back last week, except uh, I had already had a pre scheduled uh, week to be at another congregation uh, mentoring one of the, the young pastors I'm working with. But uh, certainly a special thank you to Vicar Jesse and everyone who uh, helped in my absence and uh, feeling much better uh, and doing uh, quite well. Thank you. Uh, a special welcome to our guests. We're glad that you joined us for worship this morning. We'd love if you'd use one of the information cards in your pew to share more about yourself, that we then in turn could share more about the programs and the ministries of our congregation. Uh, a number of things uh, going on, and certainly invite you to check them out. A reminder from our uh, mission team, uh, our next mission trip is coming up August 1st uh, through the 8th. I'm going again to see Wayne and Megan down in, Nick, in uh, um, Guatemala, and uh, not Guatemala, I was right, Nicaragua. My son went to Guatemala, I've still got that on my mind. Um, there are applications available in the fellowship hall and certainly invite you uh, to think about that. They're asking that those come in next Sunday. Uh, I know uh, so many people who've gone and said it's, it's really life-changing for them. Uh, to, to experience God's work in a foreign country, to, to see their work. If you have any interest or, or inkling, uh, speak uh, to Sally Joe, speak to one of our mission team, uh, come to me and I'll put you in, in contact with some of them. But I uh, would really encourage you to give that some prayerful thought, if God's working that uh, at all in your heart. Um, I, I'm going to word the next one's pretty much a plea. We do not have enough volunteers to do February Sunshine this year. We're missing a number of a key uh, Bible study leader and craft leader and, and many other positions. Uh, we're going to have to cancel it this week if we don't have enough volunteers. Uh, again, if you're interested in all uh, in helping out with February Sunshine, uh, there is a sign-up uh, on the sign-up center in the fellowship hall uh, again, speak to myself, speak to, uh, uh, call the office, but we really uh, need to get those in so that we can have that uh, program go on. Uh, it is also the Sunday of uh, Candlelight Dinner uh, sign-up. That's coming up March 1st. Uh, it always fills up. Uh, the sign-up uh, is on, again, the board uh, at the sign-up center in the fellowship hall, uh, and certainly encourage you to join us for that event. Uh, it's also a wonderful opportunity uh, to bring someone from outside the church, a great way to introduce them to, to the people, uh, to the programs uh, of Bethlehem uh, Lutheran Church. So I encourage you to do that. It usually fills up uh, often today, certainly by uh, next week. Uh, word from uh, the news, I missed it while I was here, but uh, apparently Puxatawney Phil did not see his shadow, the important things, right? Uh, early spring. Uh, in, in fact, uh, today is a unique day that hasn't happened in over 900 years. Does anyone know what's unique about February 2nd, 2020? It's a palindrome. So the date, the sixth number date would be 02022020. So if you flip it, it goes 02022020. The date is a palindrome. The last time it happened... 11, 11, 11, 11. So, yeah. And the next time it happens, it's actually 12, 12, 21, 21. And then the next time it happens, we're, we're probably long gone by that one for sure. Um, the, the next time it happens, 12, 12, 21, 21, and then the next time is 03, 03, 30, 30. So, just kind of interesting trivia for this morning. It's, it's a, uh, a unique day. I was a science major. I kind of geek out on all that kind of odd, quirky information, and uh, certainly a fun, a fun fact for this morning. The joy of this morning is that we gather in worship. We gather to, to receive God's gifts as he speaks to us. We return uh, our worship and praise to him uh, as we give thanks for all that he has done. That's really the point of our opening hymn. Praise the one who breaks the darkness, hymn number 849. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Amen. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and perform your vows to the Most High. And a call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Let us now make our confession of our sins to our gracious Heavenly Father. You may be seated or kneel for confession. Eternal God, we confess that we by nature are sinful people. We have transgressed your law in many ways, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not always been good friends, faithful neighbors, or caring family members. Our motives and thoughts have not always been pure. We deserve your punishment now and for eternity. O oh God, in your mercy, forgive our sins and restore us to a full and joyful relationship with you through the merits of Jesus our Lord. Direct our days by your Holy Spirit that we may joyfully follow your will and gladly obey your commandments as your redeemed people. In the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temples. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I see. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not. O oh, God of my salvation, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you sent your Son, the Word made flesh, to call us to yourself. In response to his call, those he summoned as his disciples followed him. By the working of the Holy Spirit, help us to hear his call, to believe in him, and to follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The Old Testament reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread through all of Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decap Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the gospel of the Lord. We profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, whom for us men and for our salvation, 
by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian Apostolic Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm back. Feels good after a couple weeks away. Thank you to uh, so many people who uh, helped out uh, for your prayers, for your support, for for coverage, for all uh, the things that lay you up when that vicious thing attacks you. Um, That is a brown recluse spider, which looks huge in that picture but look at it next to a penny. The body is barely a quarter the size of a penny, and with the legs, it's not even barely two pennies wide. It's that big. Not much of a spider. I do actually remember being bit, and yet the whole leg swells up. There is a wound that is so ugly, but getting much better. Even more so, much to my disappointment, I keep trying, no webs from my wrist, (laughs) no spidey senses, nothing. I guess it shouldn't be surprising, but isn't it still amazing how quickly things change? We're doing just fine. We're cruising along on Monday. By Tuesday night, I'm in the hospital. And there it is for five days for a spider bite. Father-in-law of a pastor I had visited Tuesday morning at Albany Med. He'd had a heart attack. They had to resuscitate him on the ambulance. He had uh, one of his arteries 100% blocked. He got home before I did. (laughs) What in the... But it's interesting how quickly things change. And really, in some ways, that's an interesting theme in some ways of the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. As he begins to tell the story of Jesus, he begins with a genealogy. He's pointing back to the Old Testament and talking about all of those that had come before him and how that promise would be fulfilled in Jesus. We then go right to the birth of Jesus, quickly followed by uh, the visit uh, of the wise men, And we're cruising along, and then all of a sudden, here's this blow. Herod, killing the innocent children of Bethlehem. Right in the middle of of this beautiful story of of Jesus' birth. But it's only an account that's six verses long, and then we get back on track. We have Jesus and the Holy Family living in Nazareth as was foretold by the prophets. He points back and and how this even as they move back is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. We come with with John the Baptist preparing the way as was foretold as well. Jesus arriving. The voice from heaven, the dove. God in, in the fullness of the Trinity is there as Jesus is baptized. He's announced uh, as the Savior, and quickly the battle is on. Jesus goes into the desert. He is tempted for 40 days. Satan attempting to deter Jesus both from who he is and, and what he has come to do. Jesus is victorious. He wins. All right, now let's go. And then... Here comes our gospel lesson for this morning. It's 
almost sudden as we read again on page five. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Another blow. You see, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. Remember way back as we hear about Mary going to visit uh, her relative Elizabeth. He foretold Jesus' way. He had been baptizing. He had been doing all these wonderful things. He's now arrested by Herod, Antipas. Not Herod the Great from what Jesus' story and the wise men, but his son, who is just as evil and just as awful. John's head eventually would be delivered to Herod literally on a platter. We come from such a roll and then all of a sudden this quick switch. Wait, what? John's in prison. What, what's going on? This is awful. We were just cruising along here. But isn't that so much the way of life? Monday's fine. Tuesday, you're in the hospital with a spider bite. It happens so often to all of us. We're cruising along, we're sailing through life, and then wham, the bad news comes. The boss wants a meeting with you this morning. The kids call you and they want to have a talk. The doctor leaves you a message on your answering machine to want to talk about the results of your test. So much of the sports world was left reeling this week over the sudden death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter and the others on the helicopter how quickly things change. Where does this leave us? Uh, What do we learn as life does these things to us? Well, certainly at some point you have to pick up that life is fragile, easily broken. How quickly things can change. The reality that sometimes we just don't have time to prepare for bad news. It just comes. And it's wrong. And life sometimes hurts. And very suddenly. It also can leave you kind of wondering. Is God at work? When everything is going wrong, where is he? Why are all these things happening? I think part of Matthew's gospel is to remind us that this is nothing new. All of a sudden we're cruising along and John the Baptist is arrested. But notice what he does. As he talks about Jesus leaving Nazareth and going to Capernaum, he goes right away to the words of Isaiah chapter 9. We read them uh, in our first lesson. He reminds us that even then, even in this awful time with awful things happening, God is fulfilling his word even in the latest evil events surrounding Jesus' life. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them 
a light has dawned. These beautiful poetic words of Isaiah paint a a fascinating contrast between light and dark. If you divide it up, there's really two sections with two parts each. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And he kind of rephrases it again. Those dwelling in the regions of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Darkness and light. Death and its shadows. Light. You see, God knows that we're dwelling in dark times. We always have been. Since the fall into sin, death has been here. Evil has been lurking in the shadows ever since. It's interesting, I love that phrase, the people dwelling in darkness. We live there. Not not just a a quick visit or a tourist stop. We live in this darkness. We dwell in the shadows of death. It isn't limited to to just me and to my experience. It, It surrounds me. It's where I reside. Dark town or deathville. It's where I live. When I can't escape it. But Matthew's gospel also reminds us who just moved to town. Who just chose to to live in Bethlehem, in Nazareth, in Capernaum. Jesus. Jesus chose to come into our darkness. When Jesus moved to Nazareth, he was fulfilling the prophecy that he would become a Nazarene. When he moves to Capernaum, Herod hadn't won. Jesus was just fulfilling the words of Isaiah. God is doing his work. And even Herod and Herod's sons can't and won't win. You see, when evil comes into our lives, when bad things happen, when spiders bite, God is in those moments doing his will, shining his light. When darkness came into Jesus' life and the imprisonment of John, how did Jesus respond? He kept doing the work that he came to do for us. Moving to Capernaum isn't defeat. We learn that in the chapters that follow, Jesus is going there to call his disciples. We just read it. At the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum's on the northeast shore, northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. God continued to work. He goes into the synagogues there proclaiming the gospel. He's healing diseases. He's teaching his disciples. Great crowds are following him. Even then, the whole point is that God chooses to live and dwell and act within our sin-filled, broken world. Even in darkness and evil, to fulfill his promises And he does that even now. All right, my hospitalization was tough. But let's be honest, not that tough. Captain ADD has a problem sitting still. 
And when you're told you have to keep your leg above your heart for uh, a number of days, it was challenging, but not that tough. And even better than that, there were times that clearly God is blessing me. I had some wonderful conversations with the nursing staff. Thanks to Bonnie's staff at our Savior's Lutheran School, insisting that she leave school early, Bonnie and I had time to just sit and talk and play games. Some of you came to visit me and me being blessed with the challenge of, again, of learning to receive care and not just give care. And that's a blessing. Me having time to pray. Quiet time to let God speak. God comes into our darkness with light people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. Those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them, on us, a light has dawned. May God shine on you no matter what's going on, fulfilling his glorious promise. In Jesus' name, amen.